other. Frederick Nietzsche said, You are always a different person. Whereas Jacques Lacan said, The I is always in the field of the other. Who is the other? The other is what one considers to be apart from the self. It is the non-self. The construction of the self invariably rests upon the relationship with the other, the association between what is the same and what is different. What is identified as different is treated differently by the self, i.e. subordinated. Othering is imperative to forming identities such as nationality, race, religion, gender, sexuality, and so on. Jacques Lacan made the distinction between the little other and the big other, the first being a reflection and projection of the ego, and thus is entirely inscribed in the imaginary order. The big other transcends the illusionary otherness of the imaginary because it cannot be assimilated through identification and therefore lies within the symbolic. Michael Warner argued that the modern system of sex and gender would not be possible without this position to interpret the difference between genders as the difference between self and other. Therefore, according to Warner, traditional psychoanalysis hold the heterosexist view that if one is attracted to people of the same gender as oneself, they fail to distinguish between self and other. Yet at the same time, as heteronormativity justifies itself by projecting its narcissism on anything deemed to be queer. Some feminists have disapproved the work of traditional psychoanalysis as blatantly sexist because it views women as a deformity. Shalumith Firestone suggested of Freud's writings that the word penis should be replaced with power to help balance the gender imbalance. Simone de Beauvoir described the other as the minority, the least favoured one, and often a woman, the second sex when compared to a man. Beauvoir argued that throughout history women have been objectified, that women have been defined as the other sex, i.e. as an aberration from the normal male sex, just as Marty Nell read, the self-identity of the boy is founded upon the objectification and negation of the other. Richard Tarnas said, The crisis of modern man is essentially a masculine crisis. Misogyny is the hatred or contempt of women and feminine values, and it has a long and dark history which still persists to this day. The suppression and subordination of women is endemic within all patriarchal male-dominated and logocentric societies, thus it is deeply embedded within our culture. Many historical figures, philosophers and scientists were renowned misogynists as were and are many institutions of power. Aristotle, for example, contended that women exist as natural deformities or imperfect males. Misogyny is generally seen as a stereotyping of women as a group rather than as individuals, therefore a misogynist may be able to develop positive relationships with some women. The word woman itself is a point of contention for some feminists as it contains the word man. After all, female is the default development path for an undifferentiated fetus, and all males ultimately come out of a woman, in contrast to the biblical story of Adam and Eve, which tells us that Eve came from Adam. Carol McCann said, Man represents both the positive and the neutral, as indicated by the common use of man to designate human beings in general, whereas women represents only the negative, defined by limiting criteria without reciprocity. Historically, women have had no real power in the world, no place in decision-making and intellectual life. Women in Western cultures have internalized that role as societal scapegoats, influenced in the 21st century by multimedia objectification and dehumanization of women within its culturally sanctioned self-loathing and fixations on plastic surgery, anorexia and bulimia. The emphasis being that women should attempt to reach an idolized version of beauty, which is of course very psychologically damaging. All of this is exacerbated by a general lack of female role models within the media. The music industry is perhaps the most misogynist operation that has accepted this side of the law. An industry which glorifies gangsters, pimps and violent men, whilst women are trained to be bitches and hoes. As Jeannie Osterheld Riley puts it, for some, misogyny is spelt R-A-P. Is it not men who are psychologically immature and deviant within our society? Is not misogyny both a cause and effect of a patriarchal society, where, according to feminists, women are placed into a sexual dichotomy of virgin or whore, or mother or whore, by misogynists? Feminist object relations suggest that boys disengage from the mother in ways which leave them emotionally isolated with hard-edged ego boundaries, therefore growing up into a manly man involves censoring all traces of femininity because it is seen as a weakness. Men, therefore, tend to compete with each other to establish a form of hierarchy and respect in social relations. This, however, is a form of psychological lobotomy which divorces such men from knowing their full being. 
Every person has both masculine and feminine principles within their psyche. A great mind is androgynous. Studies of the brain have shown that people who are functioning optimally have high levels of interhemispheric communication. Incidentally, many great scientists and mathematicians have also been great poets and philosophers. Schlein highlights in his work that there is indisputable evidence from archaeological and historical records that there was a time when men all over the world worshipped women. With the advent of the Abrahamic religions at the beginning of Western culture, Schlein noticed that the pagan earth goddess was steadily being replaced by sky and sun gods. The reason being, according to Slane, was the introduction of the alphabet, which reconfigured people's brains primarily into the masculine left hemisphere of the brain, which deals with linear processing. Schlein suggested that any culture that empowers the left hemisphere of the brain, in exclusion to the right hemisphere, witness the rise in patriarchy and misogyny. Of course, at the same time, writing involves handedness. 70 to 90% of people are right handed, the right hand being controlled by the left hemisphere of the brain. The psychological repulsion of the other is found embedded within language itself. For example, there is a left hand and a right hand. Of course, the word right also means correct. The word right, as in the direction or correctness, is phonetically identical to the word right, as in writing a book. The word left comes from the Anglo-Saxon word lift, which means weak or worthless, which also is reflected by a lack of moral strength. The French word for left is gauche, which means awkward or clumsy, whereas the French word for right is droit, which also means correct. The word for left in Italian is sinistra, which is where the root for the English word sinister comes from. In some cultures, the left hand is used for cleaning one's ass, while the right hand is used for eating. Sometimes you might receive an insult disguised as a compliment, also known as a left-handed compliment. Curiously, during the Dark Ages, the period after the fall of the Roman Empire, where literacy was lost, the status of women was regained, something overshadowed by Thomas Hobbes' famous quote which described the time as being solitary, poor, nasty, brutish and short. Doris Stenton noted that the evidence which has survived indicates that women were more nearly equal companions of their husbands and brothers than at any other period before the modern age. That is not to deny that the Dark Ages was a time filled with strife and barbarity because of the lack of social order. However, as Schlein detailed, it was a time of chivalry and courtly love. In the 9th century, for example, male troubadours arose all over Europe singing the praises of women. At the same time, female Christian mystics are revered by popes. In addition, cathedrals were built dedicated to Notre Dame, meaning Our Lady, Mary, who became the central figure of Christianity during the medieval period. At the same time, the grail replaced Ichthus as a symbol of Christianity, supposedly the grail being a feminine symbol for the uterus and vagina. Coincidentally, at the end of the Dark Ages, when literacy begins to reassert itself, the anxiety of the other begins to find its way back into the conscious mind, and the image of the devil begins to emerge within Christianity. The devil is said to be red, a colour which has long been associated with female sexuality, i.e. the vulva and menstruation. The devil bears horns, emblematic of the uterus and fallopian tubes. Also consider the word horny as in sexually aroused and its relationship to quote unquote the devil. The devil has cloven hooves, again reminiscent of the vulva. Women were said to be more susceptible to the devil due to their frivolous and gullible nature. As Schlein remarked, the most evil deity that the alphabet religions ever conjured closely resembles the symbols of the earth goddess. When did the witch hunts and religious wars become endemic? None other than during the high times of the Age of Enlightenment, also known as the Age of Reason, which further locked people into the left hemisphere with the introduction of the printing press and high literacy rates. The oppression of women was met equally by the oppression of the natural world, as Francis Bacon very tellingly and consistently used metaphors of the witch hunt torture chambers to describe how scientists should force nature to relinquish her secrets. Inestra King said, The hatred of women and the hatred of nature are intimately connected and mutually reinforcing. Theodore Rosak said, The way the world shapes the minds of male children is close to the root of our environmental dilemma. Perhaps the most interesting development in feminism is ecofeminism, which claims that androcentrism is the cause of our environmental problem. Indeed, in pre-literate societies, there are far more egalitarian relationships between men and women, and at the same time their relationship to the natural world is far more harmonious than in developed societies. Oral language cultures are far more grounded in the immediacy of their environment. Their language does not include time-binding, therefore everything remains enchanted and respected. Vandana Shiva claimed that women have a special connection to the environment through their daily interaction with it. She writes, 
Women in sustenance economies producing and reproducing wealth in partnership with nature have been experts in their own right of holistic and ecological knowledge of nature's processes, but these alternative modes of knowing, which are oriented to the social benefits and sustenance needs, are not recognized by the capitalist reductionist paradigm because it fails to perceive the interconnectedness of nature or the connection of women's lives, work and knowledge with the creation of wealth. As the ancient Chinese understood, the extreme of yang is also the birth of yin. The great challenge of our time is the imperative for the masculine to see through and overcome his hubris and one-sidedness and enter into a mutual relationship with the feminine in all its forms.